When Dorothy Day was just eight years old, she was living in Oakland, California. Her father, just two years earlier, had taken a job as a sports writer for a newspaper in San Francisco. And as many of you probably remember from your history books, in 1906, that very same year, it was April 18th, the big San Francisco earthquake hit. And that city was devastated, not only by the horrible shaking, but by the fire that raged for three days. 3,000 people died during that time. And I read just this week that half of the population of San Francisco became homeless that week. Well, little Dorothy was in Oakland with her family and she watched people from Oakland help other people in their neighborhood that needed help. And then she watched boatloads of people from San Francisco that were crossing the bay, and she saw the same thing. People made tremendous sacrifices to help people who were complete strangers. They were in need, and it didn't matter who they were. The people in Oakland did whatever it took to help the people in San Francisco. Dorothy realized as an eight-year-old, she wrote about this much later, she realized that we all have something within us as human beings that wants to reach out to people when our fellow human beings are in the greatest need. And as she watched what was going on in Oakland as this little eight-year-old girl, she asked herself the question, why can't we live this way all the time? And you know, she carried that question with her for the rest of her life. I was reading about Dorothy Day in Krista Tippett's book, Becoming Wise, an inquiry into the mystery and art of living. And Paul Ely, the author, is quoted in Krista Tippett's book, talking about how Dorothy Day saw that every single day somebody was hurting. She saw that it wasn't just during the big crisis moments of our nation or in the world where people need that kind of help. And the questions that came up in the book were, isn't someone dying every single day? Every day in our community, isn't somebody suffering from cancer? Every single day in our community, hasn't someone lost their home, their belongings? Every single day, isn't someone suffering greatly? So Dorothy Day went on to co-found the Catholic Workers' Movement. She was a Catholic. Actually, she converted to Catholicism at uh, one point in her life. But she created this movement because she wanted to put that question into practice. Why can't we live like this? Or why can't we live this way every day? And so this movement that she co-founded basically helped people who were homeless and who were hungry and who were suffering every single day. And then she looked at the big picture and said, well, if it's a good thing to help people who are suffering, isn't it even better to keep people from suffering in the first place? And so part of her movement was to lead people into non-violent demonstrations against what's wrong in our society. And she went to jail many times. She was arrested and imprisoned for things like marching for the right of women to vote, marching for homeless people, for hungry people, marching for people who need someone to speak up for them. Now, she was a controversial figure in her time, and I imagine for some people she still is, but I have to admire someone that sees suffering in the world and chooses to do something about it, rather than just saying, gee, what a shame. So 
In the book, Becoming Wise, Krista Tippett actually interviews several people and talks about Dorothy Day. One of the persons she interviewed was Eve Ensler, the Tony Award winning playwright. And at one point in the interview, Eve talks about this one evening where she was just feeling sorry for herself. She had cancer. She was undergoing chemotherapy. She was suffering. She was divorced. She felt like a failure. And she was just sitting there with all of her victimhood. And all of a sudden, it was like a light went on. And she realized she was incredibly blessed. She started thinking about her blessings. And all of a sudden, she realized my really good friend Marie comes at five in the morning and cooks for me because she knows that that's when I wake up hungry because of my chemotherapy and I need something I can eat. So she makes scrambled eggs for me. She was so grateful just for that. And then she realized that her sister would come and sit with her on the couch for hours and put a washcloth on her forehead just to make her feel better. And she was so grateful for her sister and then one of the things that wasn't going so good in her life, her mom was dying, but she realized that her granddaughter was there packing a bag so that she could go spend one last time with her mother. And she was overwhelmed with gratitude for the blessings of love in her life. And she went from feeling sorry for, for herself to feeling so good and so blessed because all of a sudden she remembered that she wasn't all alone in this after all. She had people all around her who loved her. She didn't have to go through this all alone, and she was just overwhelmed with gratitude. Another person that Krista Tippett mentions in her book is the poet Marie Howe, who's probably best known for her writing of poetry about when her brother died of AIDS back in the 1980s. Marie grieved over the death of her brother, and she was in a really, I would just say, a very down, dark place. And she talked about how all of a sudden, she realized that she wasn't alone in her suffering not necessarily because people were there helping her, but she thought, you know, there are a billion other people right now that are suffering just as much as I ha am because there are at least a billion people in the world who have lost somebody th that they love and they're grieving too. And Marie wrote about that, both in prose and in her poetry especially. She understood the importance of realizing that we're all connected. Nobody suffers alone, and most of us don't truly suffer a lot more than everybody else. Anyway, Krista Tippett is interviewing her and realizing that there's something special about realizing just how connected we are in the world through love, and it doesn't really matter what religion you are, or what race you are, or what culture you are from, you are loved. And you're connected through love. Marie Howe goes on in her interview to talk about how there's two things that are especially helpful for her to feel all the connections. And she says one of them is telling stories. And that was a big thing for Dorothy Day. She believed with all her heart that we are connected through loving each other and then talking about it. Loving each other in community, as she says, and then talking about it. And so Marie Howe talks about the importance of sharing stories, realizing that we never are alone in the things that we go through. And then the other thing she said, art. There's something about people creating beauty and even in the midst of pain. And somehow, when we go through times of pain, it's the art around us that helps connect us to the fact that we are indeed never, ever, ever alone. 
And as I was thinking about that this week, it's kind of been a recurring theme for me over the last several months, how we have artists among us. In fact, every single one of us is an artist in one way or another. And some of us are painters, some are sculptors, some are quilters, some people just excel in the art of prayer. Some people can figure out how to be creative with the most mundane things and create something beautiful. And sometimes that's just dirt. And I was thinking about how we have changed the appearance of this entire landscaping around the front of our church. How we have all been artists in participating in making this a more beautiful and welcoming church. According to Marie Howe, every single one of us has the opportunity every single day to do something creative, to connect us with others in love. In this morning's gospel lesson that Grace Eleanor read for us from the Gospel of John, Jesus talked about the importance of abiding in God's love. And what Jesus is doing in this text here is really asking the question that Dorothy Day asked, why can't we live like this? Why can't we live this way all the time? And Jesus was answering that question by saying, yes, we can live like this all all the time. We can abide in God's love. We can love God. We can love the earth. We can love people all the time. It's something that's abiding. And Jesus went on to show his disciples. Actually, at this point in John's gospel, Jesus had spent three years showing the disciples how to live like that, how to live in God's love. And this is shortly before his passion and his crucifixion, where he's sharing with them now this beautiful story that kind of came right before today's scripture lesson. It's the story, actually the parable of the vine and the branches, where Jesus said, I am the vine, and he said to his disciples, you are the branches. And talk about connection. I can't think of a more appropriate analogy or metaphor to how we are all connected than the vine and the branches. For if you take a vine, if you cut it off, if if you cut a branch off of the vine, it dies, it withers eventually. It may not look like it right away. But separate from the vine, the branch is basically worthless. It needs to be connected. And that's... Why Jesus said, abide in God's love, abide in my love. And you know, what makes that possible is because we are all connected to God and to one another. Jesus not only taught that, but he demonstrated that. And just like Dorothy Day saw people who were suffering all the time. Jesus had this way of seeing people that other people didn't see. Often people out on the margins. And the reason they were there is because people didn't recognize them as having value in their lives. And Jesus walked right over to people of all kinds and said, God loves you too. You also have value. And if we leave anybody off of the vine, we're only hurting ourselves. We're all connected. Not just the people that look like us, not just the people that happen to believe like us, not the people that we know. We're all connected. This week I saw a movie that I first saw in 1975 called The Hiding Place. Now, as a little kid, I think I was in seventh or eighth grade, I got a comic book called The Hiding Place. And then when I realized that the comic book was actually about a book, I read the entire book. And then a few years later, when I was in high school, the movie came out and I couldn't wait to see it. It's about Corey Ten Boom, who 
lived with her family in the Netherlands during the Nazi occupation. And Corrie and her family were watchmakers and clockmakers, and people from all over their city in the Netherlands came to them because they were so good at making and fixing clocks and watches. They lived a pretty mundane life as lives go, it seems like. They just spent a lot of their time fixing watches and clocks. But when the Nazis took over the Netherlands and Corey's family realized that they were taking Jews somewhere against their will, and those Jews weren't returning, and then there was those rumors at first that they're exterminating the Jews, Corey and her family said, we will do all we can, we will risk our lives to help these people because you know what? They're connected to us. They are God's children too. Somebody basically ratted on the Ten Boom family and the Nazis showed up and arrested the whole family that was there. Fortunately, on the very top floor of their building, they had created a secret hiding place, hence the name of the book and the movie. They had made it out of bricks, so when the Nazis came to see if there were secret places, if there, the butts of their guns and things that they would bring with them to smash walls didn't move, they figured, okay, there's nothing back behind that wall. But anyway, that little tiny space that they had to crawl through a, uh, a cabinet to get to was just filled with Jewish people that were afraid and had no place to go. Corey, her sister, her brother, and her father all went to concentration camps. Corey was the only one who survived. When she was in a concentration camp, one of her relatives wrote her a letter and wanted her to know something very, very important. And so, rather than just writing the letter uh, or the address to her at the concentration camp like you normally would straight across, they did it at an angle. And she thought, you know, I taught this kid how to write. He would never, ever write like that unless there was a reason. And all of a sudden she thought, it's pointing to the stamp. And so she wetted the stamp with her spit and was able to take off the stamp. And in little tiny writing, he wrote a message that all of the Jews were safe. For after the Nazis raided the house, the rest of the family and friends who were all part of the scheme to save the, the Jews, they crawled up on the roof, they snuck into the house, and all of those Jews escaped to freedom. And she was in prison just giving thanks. Now, when you read the book or you watch the movie and you watch just how hellish it was, and that's the kindest word I can think of, to be in a concentration camp. I'm blown away that she could give thanks to God for anything. It was awful. Imagine your worst nightmares and multiply them by a hundred. That's what it was like being in a Nazi concentration camp. And then to find out that all of her family members that were also in concentration camps also died. On the day that Corey Ten Boom was released from her concentration camp, she had no idea why. She just was told, you're free to go. You just have to sign this statement saying that we've treated you kindly here and, you know, and you've always been really healthy and things like that. Well, I think that may have been the only time in her life that she lied, but she <laughs> signed her name and got out of there and years later found out that it was a clerical error. She wasn't supposed to leave the concentration camp. In fact, soon after that, she realized that all of the women her age were sent to the gas chamber or to the ovens. What blew me away about Corrie Ten Boom was not just how she loved the Jewish people because they were connected, but how she said afterwards, we also have to love the Nazis. They're people too. We're also connected to them. Now, that doesn't mean that forgiveness is easy or what, or just saying it's okay what you did because it wasn't okay. But she said, if we're going to take God's love seriously 
And if Jesus told us we have to love our neighbors, we have to figure out how to do that. And so years later, she went back to the concentration camp, and she actually came across one of the guards that was there. She recognized him, and she told him that she forgave him. She told him that God loved him. She told him that they were all connected through God's love. Now, I have to tell you in all honesty, I don't know if I could do that. I hope I could, but the only way that that would be possible for me was to, would be to truly know and feel that through God's love, I'm connected, even to the people who hurt me, knowing that God's love has the possibility of changing and transforming them. Last summer, Debbie Gunning and I, our stewardship chair uh, at the time, got together and said, what shall be our theme for 2018 for our next year? And we kind of tossed around some things, but we said, well, let's focus on love. And we kind of stole something that the Hawaii Conference of the United Church of Christ was already doing. It's this mission of changing lives and transforming the world. And we said, how about if we make that our theme with the tagline, the greatest is, the, uh, or aloha, the greatest commandment. And as we were kind of figuring out just how to promote that, I remember the day that we put up those big red posters. There's one out on the bulletin board and one on the door over at Morehall. As we were putting up those big red posters and we were talking about aloha, the greatest commandment, changing lives and transforming the world, it occurred to me that day that as I was talking about these things to this congregation, I was preaching to the choir, as they say. Because I remember on that day, I started thinking about all the different things that this congregation does for our community. How we look around and say, you know, if there's hungry people going to the Salvation Army in Hanapepe, then let's make sure we're a part of that. And every single time that we go to the Salvation Army, we have enough or more than enough volunteers to feed people. When Judith Foley said, you know what? Missy and I were talking, her daughter Missy, and, and we're thinking, you know, we want to do more for people over the holidays. Maybe we could put a spare change jar up there so when people have spare change, they can just put it in there so that when people in this community on the South Shore need things, especially young families, where they're just not as well off as the rest of, them, as the rest of us, we want to help them. That change jar fills up several times a year, and we have hundreds of dollars to help people in this community. We've already talked about the Prayers and Squares ministry. I can't tell you what a great feeling it was when I went to visit Phyllis Kunimura in the hospital the day before she died, and she had that quilt with her, and her daughter told me, this made such a difference to mom. Thank you for that quilt. When I brought it to her in the hospital, she just lit up, and it was like she knew that she was loved by all of you at the church. Thank you. I could spend the rest of the day going on and on and on about all the things that this church does to show love, both to people we know and total strangers, people we may not know at all, and people who might be very different from us. And so I had to ask myself the question, why did we make that big red poster in the first place? Why do we keep it up there to remind ourselves that it's all about love and changing the world and or changing lives and transforming the world? And I realized for me, I don't know about all of you, but I need to be reminded because there are times for me when it's really easy to love other people. There are also times when it's not so easy. And I need that reminder. And when I see that big red poster, that's my reminder. I hope it's a reminder for you as well. And if you don't attend church here and see that poster all the time, find another reminder. 
creates something just to remind you that we are connected to God and to others through love. Thanks be to God.